So let's move on to the thyroid gland. Now the thyroid gland is of course located as we can see in the picture approximately uh, above, the above the thymus and above the uh, uh, close to the cricoid cartilage and in this case we should start talking about the function of the thyroid. Before we do, of course, we know that the production is, is the function is the production of thyroid hormones. The magic in this case is how these pro how these hormones are being produced. Now, in order for me to exact to explain exactly how it works, you should have the more uh, let's say general picture of the thyroid follicle. The thyroid follicle is the unit of production of the uh, thyroid hormones T3 and T4. Now, exactly this is the follicle. These circles are the thyroid follicles right here. So let's start getting to as to how these hormones are produced and what do they do. Uh, first off, let's talk about what do they do. They increase the sodium potassium ATPase uh, uh, activity in the basement cell, cell membrane. Now, what does it mean, of course? Because we have increased the amount of uh, sodium potassium and ATP, in this case, we're going to have the increased for increased consumption of ATP. So this exactly is what we start talking about the BMR, the basic metabolic rate. Now the basic metabolic rate is what our human our bodies consume without actually doing without any activity, just by itself. Now this by itself means in fact the amount of ATP that is being uh, produced, that is being actually being used in these in the ATP in the these pumps, the potassium uh, potassium sodium ATP ATP uh, pumps. So by having the increased amount of such pumps, we're going to have the increased amount and increased utilization of ATP and as a consequence, we're going to have the increased oxygen conjunction, consumption in this case. So this is what, what we mean by basic metabolic rate. And uh, one more effect that we're going to see in the thyroid hormones is the increased cardiac output. So just by knowing the basic function of the thyroid hormone, you should be able to tell what is going to happen in the case of hyperproduction of thyroid hormones or hypoproduction of thyroid hormones. Now, of course, in the case of the increased production of thyroid hormones, you're going to have increased cardiac output to the, to the event that you're going to have cardiomyopathy because of the increased amount of the work in the human, in the human body from the heart, of course. You're going to have, again, hyperventilation because you're going to have, you're going to have increased oxygen consumption beyond to the point of uh, basic metabolic, beyond to the point of basics, and so on and so on. And again, the opposite, uh, and because of the increased amount of the ATP, you're going to have, of course, as a consequence, muscle wasting, you're going to have weight loss, and so on and so on. And exactly the opposite is going to happen in the hyperproduction of thyroid hormones. So the point, again, to understand is what these hormones do, and as a consequence, predict the syndrome and predict the uh, the main clinical features of each disease that are related to the increased or decreased production of these hormones. So this is the function. Let's talk about how this, this uh, hormone is produced. Well, we saw the colloids, we saw these encircled structures. The point is that the cells are produced and the thyro, thyro, thyrocytes, sorry, thyrocytes, in fact produce the components, not the, exactly the T3 or T4 themselves. Specifically, we're going to find the first product of the thyrocytes is going to be the uh, thyroglobulin. Thyroglobulin, as the name says, is the globe, is this, the protein that is a more like globular shape that is being produced and deposited within the colloid. Again, the colloid is this area, this content, because of the uh, more physical features and chemical features of the content. This is going to be called the colloid. So this colloid is going to have, is going to receive the production of the is going to receive the thyroglobulin which is produced from the thyrocyte. This is the first step. I want you to imagine the thyroglobulin as the skeleton of T3 and T4. So first we have the skeleton. Again the thyroglobulin. As a second step we're going to have the production and the move not the production the movement of iodine from one point specifically from the bloodstream to this colloid. Again it's very important to note that the most important component of the T3 and T4 is iodide. In fact, this is going to be the location of the active effect of the uh, of this hormone. So we're going to have the import of sodium and iodine from the uh, bloodstream, and in the end, it's going to have the deposition from the bloodstream to the colloid again. Now we have the two different components: the skeleton and the let's say the uh, the body, the rest of the body, which the body is going to be in this case the iodide. Iodine and the iodine is going to be practically combined in the with the thyroglobulin. So this combination, this uh, attachment of the iodine 
to the third global is going to be of course cattle is going to be of course taken care of by the uh, specifically the thyroid peroxidase this is the enzyme that we really care about because we should understand this this whole steps of production of, of thyroid, of thyroid uh, hormones because pharmacologically speaking we will intervene in the end in the case of pathology exactly in this uh, exactly in this step so uh, in thyroid purpose is going to be this the uh, enzyme that will catalyze uh, this exact uh, that this exact uh, um, reaction it will add the iodine to the thyroglobulin in fact the end product is going to be are going to be two different molecules the d tyrosine and the mono iodotyrosine mono iodo as the name suggests is simply only one molecule of uh, iodine on this chain and the did is going to be the two molecules of iodine so now it's really easy to understand why we call it t3 and t4 well t3 is the one that contains only three units of uh, only three molecules of iodine and of course in the case of the t4 is going to be the four molecules of iodine so uh, it's important to understand why we have these two i mean why simply have just one well the difference is that we have one the t3 is the more active version of the of the of the third hormone and the second one the t4 has longer half-life and practically means that the t4 has the capacity to uh, break off only one molecule of uh, iodine and work as a T3 and of course convert itself into a T3. I want you to imagine more of the active version, the storage version. Active is the T3 and the storage version is the T4. So let's visualize them macroscopically these structures. So this is again the thyroid and by zooming in we're going to be easy. It's going to be very very easy to see that the circles, the folds are practically everywhere. And by zooming, we should be able to locate the colloid. What is important to notice and to discuss about the thyrocytes is that the thyrocytes have two different, two to three actually, different forms based on their activity. When we have high activity, when we have a high, of course, deposition, production of thyroglobulin and movement of uh, iodine from the one point from the blood to the colloid, we're going to have the high activity, we're going to have the more tall cells, low columnar, in fact cuboidal low columnar in this case and the second is going to be of course the squamous now when we have in fact the squamous morphology of the cells we're going to have the low activity of the same protein of the same of the sorry of the same uh, cell so it's going to be less amount of production of the hormone so again the active follicles have more cuboidal, more cuboidal to low columnar taller of course morphologies and uh, the squamous are going to have lower uh, of course, it's very important to notice and to talk about the parafollicular cell. Just the name says it all. Para means next to, para means close to, not exactly in the follicle. So parafollicular cells are the cells that are practically between the different follicles. So in this case, when we have this zoomed in picture, we're going to see again the typical morphology of the, of the thyroid follicle. And in between them, we're going to find different cells and these are going to be called C cells or parafollicular cells. Now, the function of this parafollicular cells is to produce calcitonin. What is calcitonin? Calcitonin tones down, reduces the amount of uh, calcium in the blood. Now, how exactly is that possible? How do we do that? How does it work? Well, in fact, calcitonin uh, slows down and inhibits the osteoclastic activity. So, the point is, osteoclasts, of course, destroy the mineral of the bone. In fact, they destroy the hydroxyapatite. Of course, hydroxyapatite is composed by calcium, phosphate, and hydroxyl groups. Now, this calcium, after it's being destroyed by the bone, is going to be released in the blood. So, if we stop, if the calcitonin stops exactly this procedure, it stops and tones down and reduces the amount of uh, calcium in the blood, of course, again, by reducing the functionality and the activity of the osteoclasts so exactly this is going to, we're going to find we're going to see again the very typical cuboidal appearance of the thyroid follicles along with the colloid itself inside and the parafollicular cells being exactly in between the follicles uh, of course it's not always that easy to distinguish them but uh, by more close uh, let's say close uh, uh, magnification we should be able to visualize them both for example these are typical examples of parafollicular cells and this is again a typical example of the follicular cells or also called thyrocytes they have they have the same name don't be confused it's exactly the same cell so this is the structure of the uh, thyroid again we're going to see it's very easy to distinguish we're going to find the stroma the capsular of course the thin electronic tissue surrounding it and in the center we're going to find 
a lot and a lot of uh, thyroid follicles in fact within the uh, the more the inner part of the structure that we have of course you also see that this structure is trabecular there's a trabec there's a projection of the connective tissue uh, that l practically lobulates the whole structure not exactly but there's this extension of the uh, connective tissue penetrating the whole structure so let's move on uh, of course this is going to be the two different just mentioning in this case we should mention the two different pathologies the hyperthyroidism and hypothyroidism where we'll discuss just a bit of the clinical features again based on the same logic and based on the function of thyroid hormones you should be able to predict them both so when we have increased metabolic, metabolic rate which is the hyperproduction of the T3 and T4 we're going to have weight loss why because we're going to have the excess excessive consumption of, uh, of oxygen excessive consumption of ATP uh, sweating increased cardiac output because of the increased um, the increased function of the potassium and the sodium potassium ATPase function in the heart dyspnea why because we have increased uh, utilization of the oxygen in this case and this is a very very interesting feature exophthalmos now exophthalmos is in fact this exact feature as we see in the picture this outwarding of the eyes this in fact takes place in some forms of uh, hyperthyroidism in this case of the of the Graves disease which is an autoimmune disease long story short this output is because we have increased deposits of immune complexes in the uh, back of the eye and as a consequence we have this protrusion of the eye this is called exophthalmos and in the case of the hyperthyroidism we're going to have exactly the opposite effects weight gain why because we have decreased bo uh, basic metabolic rate and so on and so on so this is also a very typical feature this is going to be called goiter this uh, let's say uh, uh, edema this this growth of the uh, of the of the whole of the structure of the thyroid this is going to be called goiter and this is a very typical feature of uh, thyroid malfunction so let's talk about the parathyroid glands now uh, of course the parathyroid glands are in fact so let's say imagine them as small spores deposited at the back in the posterior area and the posterior aspect of the thyroid glands and we have they have a, a different function in fact in fact we're going to find that the function of the parathyroid gland is to produce PTH parathyroid hormone now the function the function of parathyroid hormone is to control uh, the calcium of course, calcium in the blood specifically that it in fact uh, in increases the amount of uh, calcium in the blood now how does exactly how does it happen how do we do that specifically the principal or chief cells of the parathyroid cells are in fact uh, by, by the product of they produce the PTH the parathyroid hormone and work through the osteoblasts the question is how is the osteoblast even related to the calcium in the blood well, because if you remember from the bone video, the osteoblast is in fact the whole unit of both, that it controls both the bone deposition, bone formation, and bone destruction. How? Well, it would, because it produces cytokines and chemokines. Don't forget, osteoclasts are nothing more than fused macrophages. So the whole mechanism of, uh, of osteoclast formation and activity is nothing more than just a located fusion of macrophages, which are, of course, immune cells. And these immune cells are, of course, aggregated and controlled by the amount of cytokines located in the area. So the PTH specifically uh, affects and inhibits the osteoblast and actually induces the osteoblast activity to reduce the amount of uh, of uh, specifically of uh, osteoclast and osteoclastic activity and because of this we have because they have the increased uh, sorry increases the osteoclastic activity and as a consequence we're going to have the production the hyperproduction of the hyperactivity of the osteoclasts and as a consequence we will deposit the calcium in the bloodstream again long story short parathyroid hormone induces the, the osteoblasts and osteoblasts control the osteoclasts increase the activity of osteoclasts and as a consequence we have the increased amount of calcium deposits in the blood well that's the one way the second way is that it stimulates calcium reabsorption through the distal convoluted tubule of the kidney so the PTH of course has a direct effect on the distal convoluted tubule of the kidney and lastly indirectly the PTH increases the calcium in the blood from the absorption of the small intestine now we're going to find two different cells in the parathyroid gland the parathyroid cells themselves the principal uh, chief cells or and 
the oxyphil cells. Now, the oxyphil cells are not exactly, uh, we're not very, very sure of what they do. In fact, they're, uh, they have many different indications, but none of them are fully confirmed. And some say that these cells are actually transitional derivatives of uh, principal cells. In other, in other, in simpler, wor simpler ways, they are similar to the uh, cheap cells in function and in uh, and but not in morphology because they're actually bigger. So let's visualize in the microscope. So this is again the structure. We're going to find again that we have the, uh, on, the on the surrounding part. We should be able to find sometimes uh, the thyroid thyroid follicles, thyroid uh, structures, of course, because of the location and because of the different types and different way of sectioning. You could be able to find thyroid follicles in the surrounding parts. Now, when we zoom in, in fact, we're going to find that we see two different cells. We're going to find again the uh, chief cells, not to be confused with the chief cells of the gastric mucosa. These are again different chief cells. These are again, the, the term in this case uh, is again chief cell, but of course there are different functions. Don't forget this. Now these cells in fact are again the cells that produce the PTH and secrete them. So let's try to find the oxyphil cells, the oxynthic cells. Now the oxynthic cells are in fact larger in size and uh, in fact, I have different stainings. So uh, when you're looking for the oxynthic cells, you should be able to see, uh, let's say, bigger size, bigger sized cells and less stained ones. For example, these are. Uh, this could be one example of the oxynthic cells right here. Of course, the small group, as you can see, this is a very different morphology. We have bigger cytoplasm, bigger, uh, bigger size of the cells, and bigger cytoplasm. Let's try to see the more typical in this case. Here, in fact, we have clusters of oxynthic, of oxyphil cells. Now, the oxyphil cells again have uh, not, not specifically known function, just indications. So this is nothing more than we just discussed. This is the whole structure of the parathyroid. We're going to find these two cells. Of course, we're going to find dispersed and exactly, uh, let's say, sparse within the structure adipocytes, and of course, vascular uh, structures and like uh, arteries and veins and so on and so on. Typical and the same as all uh, structures that we know in the human body. So let's move on. So uh, this is in fact a very nice case that I want you to see. This is of course uh, taken from histology guide. You can see this in the uh, again in the whole section. Right, this we're going to have the 23 year old female, which is diagnosed with Graves disease. We mentioned Graves disease before. This is again the autoimmune uh, autoimmune disease that is uh, that that practically uh, presents itself as hyper uh, th hyperthyroidism in this case that presumes with exophthalmos and asthma. Asthma, of course, is because of the increased amount of the oxygen consumption, the dyspnea that we said before, and exophthalmos because of the deposition of the immune uh, complexes. So this patient goes to the goes to the uh, endocrinologist, and then the a surgeon takes a section from them, totally th takes the whole thyroid out because of this hyperthyroidism. This is a very common also uh, clinical treatment of hyperthyroidism, the excision, either part, partial or full uh, excision of the uh, thyroid. So in this case, we took the whole thyroid out and we put a biopsy with an H and E staining. So we see these three distinct areas. Now, this is very easy. This area is very easy to distinguish. We can actually, even if we zoom in, we should find uh, these are the thyroid follicles, the typical thyroid follicles. Now, in this case, they're going to be more squamous, so they're more inactive in this case. But in others, we're going to find uh, cuboidal, so they're more active. Now, this area, in fact, is this is very common to see in the microscope. Again, this is the section that includes both the uh, parathyroid gland because we can see specifically the chief cells right here, and these are, of course, the thyroid follicles. The question is, what is the third area, this area? So we zoom in in this area, and we see that these are again uh, highly. These are cells that have a very high nucleus to cytoplasm ratio, so most of it is cytoplasmic. This is a typical giveaway of that this is an immune cell. And we actually see also these structures. These are Hassel's corpuscle. So exactly in this area, this is the thyroid. Uh, so the thymus, sorry, the thymus. So we have the thymus in the same section as the, uh, as the thyroid gland and the parathyroid gland. In this case, this was an incomplete, uh, let's say, incomplete movement from biologically speaking, we have the movement from the, uh, the that the thymus undergoes uh, goes lower and the, uh, the the descends and the specifically the uh, thyroid and parathyroid glands ascend. So because of this incomplete uh, movement, this incomplete process, we have the same this section, this unusual case in this uh, specific condition. So let's talk about the pancreas. 
the last part of this discussion then this is of course we're talking about specifically the endocrine pancreas not to be confused with the exocrine pancreas we already discussed that pancreas has dual functions the exocrine and endocrine the exocrine of course is used and we see this function uh, specifically in the uh, digestion we see that the uh, we saw that the pancreas through the production of the centrosinar cells and their products so they produce specifically amylases they produce lipases proteases they produce also a uh, bicarbonate buffer to control the ph and now we're going to go to the second part of the pancreas which is the pancreatic islets and specifically islet of course is, means small island and in this case we're going to talk about the endocrine function of the pancreas so we're going to see different cells with the disposed uh, and deposed within this pancreatic islet. Uh, now, of course, unfortunately, this is not easy to distinguish. Not easy. It's impossible to distinguish uh, in the H and E, the typical hematoxic understanding method. Uh, but of course, we should know what they contain within them because they are very, very clinically important. First up, we're going to find the alpha cells. They specifically are uh, cells that are the second most frequent uh, and secrete glucagon. Glucagon, as we is the, the function of glucagon is in fact that it produces uh, produces glucose in the human blood and increases the amount of again diabetogenic it increases the amount of, uh, of uh, glucose in the blood we have the beta cells that are the most common and secrete insulin they have the exact opposite function insulin in fact uh, if we should know that insulin it practically helps the cells to absorb uh, to absorb and to uh, take glucose from the bloodstream to the specific cells themselves for example muscle cells are very very sensitive to insulin and in fact they actually reabsorb and absorb uh, glucose uh, from the blood so the combined function of insulin and glucagon are the ones that are two of the main factors that control the amount of blood glucose uh, in exactly in the human body we have also the delta cells the uh, these secrete somatostatin somatostatin in fact is this is the uh, the hormone that stops and halts uh, and inhibits the effects uh, and production of growth hormone this is the gh and also the tsh the thyroid stimulating hormone so this is exactly what the delta cells do and lastly we have the pancreatic polypeptide cells now in this case these cells are mostly uh, related to the inhibition of bile secretion pancreatic enzyme and bicarbonate secretion and long story short these are cells that control the chief cells uh, in the uh, these are the chief cells of course the gastric mucosa so to visualize the pancreatic islets in the microscope is very easy because uh, if we actually just visualize the pancreas in a low magnification we can see these more lucid more lucent areas in comparison to the very very dense areas and very very let's say uh, different staining methods they not different different staining affinities in the different areas so if we zoom into one uh, let's zoom in this one for example we can actually see the very the, we easily distinguish the difference between the density and the color of the uh, of course the asinine the pancreatic asinine and this is of course this is the pancreatic islet this is again where we're going to find the deposition of all the alpha cells the beta cells delta cells and pp cells exactly right here this is the typical uh, morphology of the pancreatic islet and of course we're going to find within them of course vascular components sparse and, and dispersed within this uh, sections so to sum up we talked about in the beginning about the hypothalamus and how this hypothalamus produces a multi variety of statins and liberins releasing and inhibit inhibiting factors that control the amount of hormones that are going to be being produced from the anterior pituitary we saw the different types of the of the uh, cells we saw the uh, chromophiles and chromophobes we saw that the acidophils are the subcategory of the chromophils. So we have the acidophils and the basophils. The acidophils are the somatotrophs and the lactotrophs. And the basophils are, in fact, the three different subcategories. Thyrotrophs that produce TSH, the gonadotrophs that produce uh, FSH and LH. And uh, lastly, we saw that the same, the basophils produce also the corticotrophs that produce the proprio melanocortin, which, in fact, as a consequence, produces the ACTH. Uh, and we saw that these specific hormones have a specific function in the specific one that they worked in. Specifically, ACTH plays a role in the production of uh, cortisol in the adrenal cortex, along, of course, with the rest of the mineral corticoids and the weak androgens in this case. TSH produces ends the result of the production of T3 and T4 through the thyroid. Uh, the FSH and LH will be discussed detailedly both in the next two videos. The ADH and oxytocin that are being released 
and not produced from the posterior pituitary, the neurohypothesis, only released because these two are produced by the uh, two nuclei that we saw in the hypothalamus. The ADH works on the kidney specifically uh, and to induce the production of aquaporins and as a consequence to reabsorb water to increase, of course, the amount of liquid in the blood. Uh, oxytocin has a dual, again, both of them are muscles uh, in the myoepithelial of the mammary gland and the oxytocin and the, sorry, in the uterine contraction muscles in the female urine, in the female reproductive system. Prolactin, of course, works on the mammary gland to produce milk. And lastly, the growth factor to work on, to, that works on the bone. And of course, we saw also in the adipocytes, in the cartilage, in the bone, and generally in the connective tissue. So this is again taken from the histology guide. This is a very, very nice way to review uh, your knowledge and to review and to revise, of course, your studying from this chapter. Thank you very much.